Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which, you, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of Spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us with this word from your servant. And Father, we pray that you help us to take these words to heart, that we submit to your discipline, that we receive the adoption as sons. We are so thankful, Father, uh, that you have brought us into your household through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, help us to live as your sons and daughters and to accept your discipline. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, well, as has been mentioned already, it is Christmas Eve today. And some of the waiting that we do this time of year is nearly over. Right, tomorrow, we get to open presents. Right, that's the good stuff. That's, uh, we've been waiting for these kinds of things. And we get to... Well, the nice thing about Christmas is we have the date set. We know when it's going to happen. You get up on X morning and you receive good things. Over the course of the past month, we have been talking about a different kind of waiting, uh, waiting for the return of our Lord. And in that case, we don't have any kind of set date or time. All right, who knows when our wait will be over? Only the Father himself knows. We've talked over the last month about how our faith consists of waiting on the Lord. We've talked about some of the things that we must endure as we await his return. We've talked about temptation. We've talked about persecution. We've talked about hardship. And we've talked about what a danger those things can be to our faith. Because those things cause people to give up. Right, there are people who, and, and Jesus talks about this in the parable of the, the sower. Right, there are people that face temptations, and the temptations get the better of them. And so they go back into the world. There are people who face persecution for the sake of the faith, and they are cowed by it. And so they, they shrink away from the faith. There are people who suffer hardship, and cannot reconcile that hardship with the faith that they hold, and so they abandon that faith. Right, the exact reasons differ from person to person, case to case. But it's pretty common for people to struggle with the why in all of this. 
A person who's trying to follow the Lord may struggle with wondering, well, why do I keep encountering the same temptations? And why do I keep struggling with the same temptations? And why is it that no matter how hard I try, I seem to make little progress. And even whenever I make progress, it's very easy to undo that progress. And I keep facing these temptations. And if, even if I do conquer one temptation, that just means there's another one around the corner that now I have to learn that one and master that one. People wonder, why? Why, do, why does God allow me to suffer? Why does God allow the, the unrighteous to thrive and the upright uh, to, uh, to wither? Why does God allow... Uh, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? What we really want to know is why God is asking us to wait. And it goes back to what we talked about in the very first message in this series. Uh, the, the, we talked about brethren in the first century who struggled with the idea of the Lord's return. I remember, we had some in Thessalonica who were convinced that they had missed it. We had some that Peter wrote to who were convinced that it was never going to come. And it's a big hang-up for people. Because God could, with a word, fix everything and bring the resurrection about now. Right? The consummation of all things could happen this very moment. There's no reason why not. And so we might be left struggling, wondering, well, why are we waiting? Or to put it in the words of the, the people that Peter was writing about in 2 Peter 3, you know, why does God delay? Where is the promise of his coming? Well, the Hebrew writer discerned that kind of struggle in the people that he was writing to. You know, the people he was writing to were suffering for their faith. They had undergone some hardship. They were particularly undergoing persecution. The Spirit guided the Hebrew writer in addressing that struggle. And then the Spirit preserved that message for us because the Spirit knew that we would need it too. We learn in today's reading that one of the things that God is accomplishing in us as we await the return of Jesus is he is disciplining us. I want to talk about what that means today and how we receive that discipline. Because again, it's a big part of who we are as Christians. It's a big part of what it means for us to wait on the coming of the Lord. We're not just waiting passively. We are, in fact, under the Lord's discipline. There is a purpose and a goal to that, and we can either participate in it or fail to participate in it. And the first thing I want us to consider this morning is that whenever the Hebrew writer tells us it is for discipline that you have to endure, right, that the, the Lord is disciplining us, should recognize that doesn't mean that he is punishing us, which is what we sometimes think of whenever we hear the word discipline. That's sometimes the way we use that word. Right? Sometimes we say, I'm disciplining my child as a euphemism for he's getting a whooping. <laughs> And I mean, that, that kind of factors into maybe why we as adults sometimes hear the word discipline and our minds automatically run to punishment. That is a little kid's way of thinking about discipline. That discipline equals punishment. Right, and again, sometimes grown-ups get suckered into thinking that way too. Um, and just as a, as a side note, you know, those of us that are in the process of disciplining children would do well to remember this as we are disciplining those children. The discipline, if punishment is not the only discipline that we give to our children. If it is, we shouldn't be surprised if they grow up to be adults with a blinkered understanding of what discipline means. And they become undisciplined whenever they are out from under our thumbs. Discipline 
means that God is helping us to become mature. It's about growing. It's in particular learning to do what is good and right, even whenever we don't naturally want to. That's what discipline is. And it's something that God has always done with his people, something that he does with us today. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. God has been having this conversation with his people from the very beginning, ever since he had a people. He's had this conversation with them about discipline. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, we read, The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Right, so all of this, Moses tells Israel at the outset, all of this is for Israel's benefit. Right? They get to grow and prosper. But here's what it consists of. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing them. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land Land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herd and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied all that you have is multiplied then your heart be lifted up and you forget about the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water who brought you water out of the flinty rock who led you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power, the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the, God makes to, that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. You see the cycle that the Lord says Israel will go through if they are not subject to discipline? Now he's going to take them into a land that is rich, flowing with milk and honey, as we say. And they're going to get there, and they're going to forget themselves. They're going to forget what's what, and they're going to be haughty and lifted up. What the Lord does for them before he even takes them into that land is he disciplines them. He gives them the equipment to know better. 
Right? They're going to get into that land and they're going to be tempted to think, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. But their experience is going to remind them otherwise. Now, wait a minute. I know that this isn't me. I know that my life doesn't consist in this wealth, in this plenty. I know what's right. I know what's good. The way that the Lord teaches them that is by humbling them in the wilderness beforehand, letting them hunger and feeding them with manna so that they know where their food comes from and they know what their life consists of, that it doesn't consist of food. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's discipline. And just as the Lord did that with his people Israel, so does he do it with us, his people, the church. What he's looking for, well, the, the result of discipline, is the sort of person that the Apostle Paul models for us at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. As he's talking to the Corinthian brethren about the way that they exercise their right to eat different kinds of meat, and particularly meat sacrificed to idols, and he's talking about the need for restraint. Just because you have the right to do something doesn't mean that you ought to be doing it. Doesn't mean that it's good or right. right? You have a right to do something, it doesn't make it right for you to do it. Not all the time, anyway. And he gives several examples of the cor over the course of 1 Corinthians 9. And he wraps it up this way. Let's start in verse 19. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. All right, but notice, start with the, the mindset of Paul. What he is able to do, even though he is free, he has made himself a slave. This is, this is the fruit of discipline. Nobody is compelling him to do this. Instead, he has, he has reached maturity where he recognizes that he ought to do this himself. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not, my, not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. All right, Paul shows the fruit of discipline, that he is choosing to do what is good and right, even when he doesn't necessarily feel like it. But that's what discipline is about, and that's why we are waiting. At least the Hebrew writer tells us that our wait is part of our discipline. Because we are in the process in this life of learning how to grow up in the image of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, I mean, there's a reason why we, we liken ourselves to children. 
in this way because the Bible tells us of an incredible change that we will undergo. All right, we're used to changing as we get older. Right, there's the transition from childhood into adulthood. You change. And as adults, we, you, know, you look back, you know what that change was like. And as you get older, you continue to change. Right? For, uh, you know, for some people, there's, there's more of a hard dividing line. In fact, we even call it the change. Um, for men, it typically tends to be self-imposed. <laughs> we usually call it the accident. <laughs> and that's, that's what changes us <laughs> as we get older. Um, when we come to, when we are forced to recognize that we are no longer young adults, um, but have been changing. The Bible tells us of an incredible change that we are going to undergo, all of us. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. 1 Corinthians 15, 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. Well, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You see, Paul even starts to talk about it there at the end are waiting and how we have something that we are looking forward to. What we are right now is very different from what we are going to become in the resurrection. We are growing up. Even those of us who think of ourselves as grown-ups. In the spiritual sense, we are all still babies and little kids. 
Recall something that our Lord tells us. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord's words are more than just a metaphor. We really are little children. And how do you make sure that little children grow up right? You discipline them. Understanding that we are growing children should put into perspective why it can be so difficult for us to wait on the Lord. It may imagine the most annoying and most impatient your own little kids have been. They all are. You can think of a moment. Think of some really annoying little kid that you know who's being annoying because he just he won't wait. We are still that way as adults, spiritually, whenever we chafe under the discipline of the Lord in this life. So why am I being tempted? Why am I being persecuted? Why am I facing hardships? Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we're asking God all the time. Are we there yet? From God's perspective, we know that there are, things go that there are other things going on during this time of waiting as well. Right? We've, we've read this a few times, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. All right, that's part of why God is waiting, as it were. But his plan includes those of us who have already repented but are still waiting. Our waiting has a purpose. Our wait is to learn to be humble before the Lord. Our wait is to learn to do the Lord's commandments and to keep his will. Again, to do what is right and good, even whenever we don't necessarily feel like it. To make ourselves slaves, even though naturally we are free, as Paul talks about. That's discipline. That's us growing up. That's the purpose of our waiting. Now, all of this should encourage us because, again, it shows, us, it shows us our place in things. Whenever we say that we are all like little kids, we're all like little babies spiritually, that's not entirely derogatory. There's an encouraging element of that because whose kids are we? The Hebrew writer tells us. The discipline that we receive, we're receiving because we are God's children. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor, by, nor be wearied by him when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And if you're left without discipline in which all have participated, you are illegitimate children and not sons. All right, but we receive discipline because we are God's sons and daughters. Consider the honor that it is and the comfort that it is to be called a child of God. To have the perfect and good and loving creator of everything <clears throat> as your father. When we're struggling for the faith, we should remind ourselves that the struggle is a sign of God's fatherly love for us. Are you undergoing some temptation? 
That is because God loves you. In the moment, the Hebrew writer says this, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. That's true. In a moment of temptation, that's not pleasant. But we can stop and remember everything that the apostles and the prophets have taught us. First off, that God has set the limits by which we may be tested. We know that any temptation that we have is a temptation we can overcome. And we are being tempted because God loves us as sons and daughters and is disciplining us. All right, whenever we are being persecuted, it's because God loves us. Whenever we face some hardship, it is because God loves us. And we can stop and remind ourselves of those things as we go along. Again, in the moment, it doesn't look or feel like love. But yeah, that's the way that it always is with discipline. Right? When, you, when you got a spanking or when you got grounded or when you got put on a, a schedule so that you, could only, you can only watch this much TV or you can only play video games for this long or you can only have this much ice cream or this, that, or the other thing. That never, ever felt like love, right? But later on, we recognized it for what it was. It's the same with the Lord, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So the call this morning is to receive the discipline of the Lord patiently and humbly. You know, you can... When it comes to discipline, you can be an easy learner or a hard learner, right? We all know what that's about. You can be receptive or you can resist. The thing about the Lord is that he is a perfect father. And do you... Who are you thwarting whenever you try to resist the discipline of the Lord? You're not thwarting God. <laughs> You're just making things harder on yourself. As we receive the Lord's discipline, let's do it with open eyes, knowing what it's for, that we may be humbled, that we may learn to do good and to keep his commandments, that we may learn... That man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so as we undergo all of these things, let us strive to learn the lessons and to grow in our faith. So that whenever the Lord comes, we will be found ready and waiting. We invite everyone this morning to begin that waiting and to persist in that waiting. If you've not obeyed the gospel, we urge you to do that today. This is the only day that we are guaranteed. This is the only time that we are given. Turn away from the ways of this world. Confess that Jesus is Lord. Be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. And live faithfully waiting on the coming of our Lord. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you make your need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.